So again, everyone, welcome to the No Internship, What Should I Do This Summer Workshop. Well, here's the quick and dirty. This is what you can do this summer if you don't have an internship. We are going to go through seven items that you might do this summer, and you can do more than one of these things. Does it, so it's just a list of options for how you might spend your summer. So we're gonna go through, um, actually still you can get an internship, it's not too late. Volunteering, maybe learning a skill, prepping for a test for any of you going to grad school or considering grad school, working on an independent project, strengthening and expanding your network, or maybe conducting research with a professor. So the first point, what can I do this summer if I don't have an internship? It is not too late to get an internship. You can still get an internship. I actually just did a search myself right before this workshop to see what summer opportunities were still available, um, just a Google search, and there still are opportunities. So the same ways you were already searching for internships through your network, through your friends, family, classmates, online, on LinkedIn, Google, Indeed, what have you, you can still do that. There are still opportunities available. There might be fewer opportunities and you may not start until July um, and have it'll be a shorter internship, but there are still opportunities available. So we don't want you to give up and think that I can't get an internship this late in the game. You definitely can. Um, you can also think about creating your own internship. This is something that a lot of students don't realize that they can do. Um, this is something I've actually done. And it's just a matter of if there's an organization that you're interested in working for and you think that you have some kind of skill set that you can contribute, you can actually read out, reach out to them and, and figure out, is it possible um, for me to intern with you this summer? So for example, if there's an organization in your community that would benefit from having a stronger social media presence and that's something you'd wanna run for them is like, actually, let me go ahead and build your Instagram or Facebook page or what have you, and I will run that. That could be your internship for the summer as a small example. So it is actually possible to create an internship, create your own internship. The only thing we um, recommend with that though is to have a very clear idea of what you would want to do at that organization and what you would get out of it um, instead of just going in and telling them, hi, I wanna intern here. Um, you wanna come in with a plan of your own so that it shows that you've thought this through and you're being very intentional about why do you wanna intern at this place. So thinking about not only what do they need and what can you get from them, but how can you help them and what, again, existing skill sets are you already bringing in? Maybe you're multilingual and you can offer to translate their website into another language. Um, maybe you have coding skills and you can build them an app, what have you. So again, just thinking about like, okay, if I'm gonna reach out to them, I have to have some kind of game plan of like, what do I want it, what, what do I want this internship to look like? So that is um, also a real possibility is to create your own internship. It is very possible that um, because it is a little bit later in the game and then in the case of creating your own internship that those internships might end up being unpaid. And so we also have a couple of resources here um, to help you support your internship. So there's this link on our website about how to financially support your internship. So some of the, some of the schools you might be a part of actually offer funding for internships. I know BSOS, RHU, and public policy do. Um, and then the UMD Career Center also offers its own um, unpaid internship funding. So that's just something to think about, as well as you could also look into potentially receiving academic credit for your internship, um, maybe through your department or through your school. Just checking the chat. Again, if you have any questions at any time, please um, DM them to Jose. The next thing you could spend your summer doing is volunteering. So kind of in a way um, that you can create your own internship, you can also create your own volunteering opportunity. There's obviously existing volunteer opportunities that you can find in your community. One resource we list here is Idealist. I personally really love Idealist. It's kind of like Indeed, but it's specific to nonprofit and like social organizations. So it actually has listings of full-time jobs, internships, and volunteer opportunities as well as this great article here about virtual volunteering, because some organizations like United Nations, um, Smithsonian 
have already had virtual volunteering programs running um, even before the pandemic, sometimes because they're international organizations and so they wanna expand their reach. So they've created these virtual volunteering opportunities to get involved. But you can also create your own volunteering opportunity in the same way that you can think about um, creating your own internship. What skill set do you have that might be beneficial to the community? Um, I know, for example, at the beginning of the pandemic, when um, a lot of parents were starting to homeschool their kids, I had a friend who's an engineer who actually just posted on his Facebook, like, hey, I'm an engineer. Uh, I'm happy to help your kids with like chemistry tutoring or physics tutoring um, as you are homeschooling. And so that was just something that he offered himself as a knowledge that he had. Um, so that's also something to think about is like, how can I give back to my community at the same time gaining experience, gaining those skills. Last thing I wanted to point out was fundraising. So fundraising um, is a great way to also get some skills because it's not just, you know, give me money, but it's a little bit more savvy than that, right? You have to market whatever the cause is, manage the funds, distribute the funds. And so that can also be a great way to give back to your community um, and also gain some skills through volunteering. Uh, Trisha, before we move on, we have one question. I went ahead and chatted it to you. Um, the question we got was like, for international students, can you do unpaid internships without getting a CPT authorization? Do you happen to know? So um, even if it's an unpaid internship, international students still have to get work authorization. Yeah, just double checking the question, make sure I got that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. yeah, international students, yeah, international students can do unpaid internships, um, but they still need to get work authorization regardless. Okay. All right, any other questions? Are we good to move on? All right, well, um, welcome everyone. My name is Jose. I know I've been interacting in the chat a little bit. Um, I'm the other co-host and I'll be taking over for the next couple of slides. Um, but the next thing we want to talk about is using this time to learn a skill. I mean, I know that you're con continuously getting skills like inside of the classroom, you're probably getting them in your student orgs, um, any other involvement on like, you know, on campus or virtually at this point. Uh, but this can be a really good time for furthering some of those skills and really beefing up your resume a little bit. So we're going to talk about four things that you can do to learn a skill, a couple of uh, resources, excuse me, a couple of resources that could be uh, helpful for you that are pretty intuitive to use and that are free for you to use as a UMD student. So the first resource that I wanna go ahead and talk about is LinkedIn Learning. LinkedIn Learning is an online library of instructional videos, little like mini courses that are related to various different like, skills, various different content areas. This is something that you do have free access to as a UMD student. So we have the link there on the screen. And when you go ahead and click on the link, um, it'll take you to the landing page for LinkedIn Learning, where you'll go ahead and log in with your UMD credentials. You'll be met with the uh, cast screen that you're probably all too familiar with by this point. But then from there, you have pretty much unlimited access or as unlimited as is available on LinkedIn uh, to help you discover new skills. So these are skills that just, you know, I went in last night just to look at them and I, I took note of a couple of classes that are being offered, but there are things like intro to graphic design. So things that are really like content, like heavy, like really like technical. Um, but then there are also other things too that lend themselves to soft skills. So things that you might want in the future as a professional. So things like maybe like business etiquette. Um, there are also things that you can do to get a jump start on skills that you're either learning in class, things that you maybe will learn or would like to learn. So an example of that might be a uh, learning Python, a Python for beginners course. So Trisha went ahead and logged in. And as you can see, there are just a bunch of different courses that you can go ahead and take, a bunch of different like videos that you can go ahead and engage with. Some of them have like that popular um, uh, marking there. So those are of course the popular uh, videos that a lot of different people are paying attention to. 
Uh, so I see there like Trisha is someone who's interested in career development. So you get like, um, you get suggestions based on like interests that you select. I believe when you first make the profile, um, so I think that this can be a really good resource too. Like I know that one of the examples I gave was intro to graphic design. I'm someone who's really interested in graphic design, like art, photography. So my page is kind of curated to that, but you can also go ahead and use the search function the way that Trisha just did. So I think we got a question in the chat. Um, can you copy and paste the link to them? Uh, Trisha, could we copy and paste the link to the LinkedIn Learning um, into the chat, please? Thank you so much. And we're gonna go ahead and wait for the slides to come back up. All right, so. All right, perfect. So there is the link to LinkedIn Learning. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next resource. And these are massive open online courses or MOOCs. Um, they're similar to LinkedIn courses, uh, the LinkedIn instructional videos, in that they teach you about different content areas. Um, the main difference with the massive open like online courses and LinkedIn learning is that these are classes that are you know, sometimes available through universities, sometimes available through organizations. Uh, the massive in the name comes from the fact that a lot of people around the world tend to take them. So, you know, UMD has a couple of MOCs that Trisha will go ahead and show just now with the link that she accessed. But these are also MOCs that other people can take. And the nice thing about these two is that these tend to be collaborative. Like there are a couple of courses where you can go in and you're actually interacting with others through like discussion boards. Uh, maybe there's like a video component to them. Um, maybe there are other ways in which you're communicating with people who are similarly engaging with these MOCs. Um, other nice things about them too, I do believe that through the ones that are offered through UMD, you have the option of auditing them. So you get access to like the assignments and the assessments if you audit them. I think, or I, I don't think you get access to them if you audit them, my apologies. I think you get access to like the course material. I do think that Maryland though gives you the option of getting certificates in the MOCs. So there you would have the option of getting your certificate that would give you access to the assignments, to the assessments, you'd get a certificate. And these are nice things that you can go ahead and put on a resume. These are things that you can go ahead and maybe talk about in a cover letter or talk about in an interview that you took courses in this, that you did some like outside of the classroom training in X, Y, and Z, and that maybe you even got a certificate in them. So as you can see, Trisha is currently logged on to the MOC um, uh, landing page. And you'll see that, that there are a couple of different courses that you can go ahead and enroll with, some related to more like um, technical skills and some related to more, I guess you can call them life skills. So things like interviewing and resume writing in English. But then we also have like survey data collection and analytics, um, cybersecurity, entrepreneurship. So if these are things that are interested, like interesting to you, or if you're just interested in checking out what else they have to offer, um, I would go ahead and check the link that is in the presentation. Great. So the next thing that we're gonna talk about is something that maybe, you know, if you've got enough free time uh, on your schedule, you're probably already doing for pleasure a little bit, um, but it's reading. You know, reading can go beyond kind of like this like pleasurable, like self-care activity. Um, it can actually be a way of becoming a little bit of an industry expert, um, gaining industry knowledge. So, you know, in addition to maybe some of the books that you are reading, this summer can maybe be a time for you to read up on industries that you are currently maybe hoping to work with, industries that you're maybe a little bit interested in, but don't actually know a ton about. And this can take place in a couple of different ways. You can read maybe books, maybe you can read articles coming from journals that are related to like that discipline that you're hoping to go into. Maybe you're reading um, blogs or maybe you're reading like transcripts of uh, podcasts. Whatever it is, there's a lot of reading material that you may be able to engage with that maybe you don't have the time to do during like the regular semester. But this can be a really good time to kind of like fill in those gaps in your knowledge. And like I initially mentioned, becoming a little bit of that industry expert. Uh, it's not uncommon uh, when I'm reviewing like uh, cover letters for students who come into our career center 
for me to read a cover letter where a student maybe talks about a book that they read that was really influential in their decision making, or maybe they'll talk about um, an article that they read, maybe a blog that they frequented, something that helped develop like their career interests, um, maybe something that even came out of the company. They'll say that, you know, I read this article that you put out, I read this blog post that you put out, and it made me interested for this reason. These can be really good ways of one, just uh, establishing the fact that you do have interest and prior knowledge in the industry that you're hoping to uh, break into, but then also it can be a really good way of hooking in the person that maybe you do wanna work for in the future. So all in all, I think that reading can be uh, a really good way of just kind of setting yourself up for future success. And that kind of ties into the last bullet there, which is take advantage of the library resources and subscriptions. As a UMD student, I'm not entirely sure where they are in terms of like physically loaning out materials, but online at least, you have access to so many different resources, things like eBooks, you have resources to um, uh, articles, you have access to full journals. And again, these can be really good sources of you uh, kind of filling in those gaps and learning a little bit more about your industry, maybe even outside of the classroom. As a personal example, I'm currently a grad student in psychology here um, in Maryland. And, you know, I like free. I like not overpaying for things. Journals can be expensive, but they're things that I need to know. So I'll just get all my journal articles through the library. I'll, um, you know, I'll request a journal article or I'll request a journal itself. And I'm able to get that for free and kind of like fill in the gaps as needed. And that's something that you can do too even going outside of just like reading material or maybe some more like academic things, there are a couple of other resources that you have access to as a UMD student. So one resource that I, I personally didn't know um, existed up until a couple of days ago was that through the library, you can actually get like remote access, like a virtual desktop on campus. So there you have um, access to a couple of uh, softwares that maybe you don't have on your own computer, but that would be available on campus. So this can be a good way of becoming a little bit more proficient in some of these uh, programs that you need. For example, in my field uh, as an undergrad, we used um, uh, R a lot. So R is maybe something you can learn. You also have access to um, kind of like virtual consulting through the library. So there you can get a head start on learning a little bit more about research. So if you're someone who's interested in research, you can go ahead and learn a little bit more about what research is, how to develop a research question, um, learning a little bit more about like different like online journals, but also databases. Um, again, these are things that you can always talk about like in interviews and cover letters on resumes, and you can get that proficiency through a lot of the resources that are available through the library. Right. So next we're gonna talk about using this time to maybe prep for a test. So if you are someone who maybe is going on to pursue further education, chances are, that you might have to take a test in order to be admitted to the program of your choice. So these can be things like the GRE, maybe even like the LSAT, but this can be like the perfect time for finding that time to either self-study, find a group study, or maybe even sign up for a class. I know that these are things that when I was, um, you know, like a junior and a senior, I was kind of putting off just because of like the demand of the semester, but now might be a good time to come up with a strategy and say, you know, what is my studying gonna look like? what is my approach to this test gonna look like? In terms of signing up for a class, it might also be helpful for you to get a good idea of like what uh, self-study maybe like apps are out there or what programs are out there. I know for me, in order to be admitted into my current grad program, I had to take the GRE. So I took advantage of uh, services like Kaplan and Magoosh in order to study for the GRE. And the nice thing about that too, is that they have different paces. So you can do like a crash course that takes like a month. You can do maybe like a three month thing, or you can personalize that further. And all in all, it, I think that this summer could be a nice time for you to just kind of like pay attention to how much time do I have? How much time do I think I need? How do I fit in the studying? Uh, I would also maybe use this time to get a little bit familiarized with some online communities that exist that can help you prep for your tests. There are circles on, for example, like academic Twitter, uh, academic like Reddit communities that can help you learn a little bit more about what goes into these tests, um, resources that they use to study for these tests, uh, you know, uh, maybe like insider knowledge into some of the programs that maybe you're hoping to apply these tests for. 
uh, I know that I was someone who was using like grad cafe a lot to learn about these different tasks, how to best study for them, like what to expect. And I found that that was really helpful once I actually went into the test. Uh, but prepping for a test involves so much more than just like simply studying. You can also use this time to plan like a strategy involving when you're gonna study for your tests, how you're gonna gather your prep materials, whether you've thought about like registering and uh, setting aside that time for prepping, uh, researching what schools require what tests and by when, and then finally, you know, giving yourself that time to retake a test if it comes down to that. These are all things that I kind of wish I had taken into account when I did the GRE the first time around. So if this is something that you can see that you see yourself doing in order to advance um, your education and your career, then I would encourage you to think about all of these different questions, kind of like check them off the list, just so that you're making sure that you're setting yourself up for success. All right, and then I'll hand it back over to Trisha. Thanks, Jose. I was just answering some questions in the chat. So the next thing you could also do this summer is work on an independent project. And these are just a couple of options that are listed. Don't know if you can see my cat hanging out. <laughs> but you could work on an independent project this summer. That might be building an app for those in the tech field, maybe blogging, podcasting. Everybody seems to be podcasting these days, maybe creating a YouTube channel, starting an Etsy shop, Etsy shop. And these are all really great ways to maybe pursue a passion project that you've been putting off, as well as to get, again, just gain more skills. Like for example, with running a YouTube channel, you know, you have to come up with that content. You have to schedule time to record and edit videos and get familiar with, um, you know, those different uh, tools that you need to actually do that. And then you have to market your channel um, engage with engage with your subscribers, things like that. So there's a lot that goes into all these things and they're great opportunities to, again, try something that you might be interested in at the same time, gaining skills. I think some of the coolest things I've ever seen on people's resumes are those independent side hustles that they've taken on. I remember one person I saw on her resume, she, um, um, she was a photographer and she had been doing that like since high school, like just her own little business of like doing photography, doing photography for like weddings and graduations and those kind of events. And she downplayed it so much. And when I asked her about it, um, she I asked her like, you know, kind of like approximately how much money do you make or like how much do you charge per hour? And when she told me, and then I was like, okay, so if you do that times five years <laughs> since you've been doing it since high school to now, that's like a ton of money. Um, so if you've been doing something like that, um, like definitely own it because that is such a, I, it's such a cool thing. Um, it's different. And again, it's, it, it shows your interest, um, to whatever you're applying to. And again, it's a great way to gain skills. I think that this one is me. Um, so now for we're gonna go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, networking. I know that networking is a little bit of maybe like a buzzword in terms of like uh, this point in your professional development. Like you hear a lot about networking. Hopefully with these resources, we can demystify what networking actually is, make it a little bit less scary and maybe even a little bit more accessible to you. So the first uh, kind of link that we have up there, that'll actually take you to our Career Center webpage for networking. So maybe that can be a good starting point if you're someone who isn't as familiar with networking or just wants to learn a little bit more about what next steps might look like for you in terms of networking. Uh, I think that this uh, webpage can also be a really good resource just to learn more about who to network with specifically. I think oftentimes a lot of people hear networking and they think that it has to be with like big name people, like some of the people that are really high up in companies, really high up in like the fields that they're doing. And, you know, they maybe see it as like learning from like the best of the best or like the experts, but that's not necessarily the case. Networking can be with classmates. Networking can be with different like organizations or associations. Networking can be maybe with um, someone who you don't quite know who just so happen to start working in the field that you wanna work in. So these are all good people to network with, but then the question becomes, 
how exactly do I find them? How do I get into contact with these people if I do wanna learn a little bit more? And so the next three resources I think can help you get connected. So first we're gonna start off with LinkedIn. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just assume that you know, a good chunk of people uh, who are here today maybe know about LinkedIn or maybe even have like a LinkedIn account where they're going ahead and filling out their profile with just like their own like professional experiences. But LinkedIn can actually be used beyond just kind of like establishing your presence and filling out your profile. LinkedIn can actually be a really good way for learning more about like the community that's out there related to the work that you wanna do, um, or even reading a little bit more about like different job titles that you haven't quite heard about or that you've heard about, but don't quite know much about. So in addition to like the search bar, which is of course where you can go ahead and search for different job titles and maybe find profiles related to that, LinkedIn also has this really cool feature called the alumni tool where you can get connected with UMD alumni and maybe read a little bit about like their day in the life or maybe even connect with them. So as Trisha, as you can see Trisha doing on the screen, Trisha went to the University of Maryland's like official school page. And then once you get to UMD's page, you, got, you will click on that little tab that says alumni. And essentially what it does is it pulls up alumni who are affiliated with UMD in some way, shape or form. You'll see there that there's almost close to like 300,000 alumni at this point. And you'll be met with a couple of different filters. So maybe the first few filters aren't necessarily maybe the most appealing to you. So things like, you know, where they live, but there are also a couple features like, what or filters, things like where they work, um, uh, what they do, what they studied. Are there any more beyond that? There we go. Yep. So what they're skilled at, and of course, like how you're connected on LinkedIn. So this can be a really good resource for you to go in. And if you have an idea of some of these filters that are most important to you, you can go ahead and filter through them uh, and then find alumni who match these filters of yours and possibly connect with them. And I know that it can be a little bit scary to like reach out to someone who maybe you don't quite know. So even if you don't reach out, this can still be a really good resource for being able to maybe like look at their profile and get a sense of like, what are things that they uh, do in like their day to day? What are examples of like, you, you know, what did their career trajectory look like? Um, just like what information can I get from this profile? And that can be a really good way of kind of like broadening your scope of the field, but also building out your network if you do choose to reach out to them um, with a little bit of a message, you know, inviting them to answer a couple of questions that you have. And so the next resource is Terrapins Connect. This is a resource that is run out of our alumni association. And it's a little bit similar to the LinkedIn alumni tool. And that with Terrapins Connect, um, it's a platform for students to access alumni who are interested in maybe giving back, um, maybe, uh, if they're interested in doing resume reviews, maybe they're interested in doing a little bit of like short-term informal mentoring. Maybe they're just interested in how doing informational interviews and teaching students about like uh, their career trajectory and what their field is like. Regardless of, you know, why alumni are in there, they're in there because they want to connect. So I think that this can actually be like a nice little, I don't know, like cushion, like a nice little like baby step to work up to maybe messaging people on LinkedIn in that, you know that these people are in there because they wanna to talk to students, because they wanna go ahead and answer these questions. So sometimes it might feel a little bit safer just to reach out to someone on Terrapins Connect and say, you know, I'm a current student and I'm really interested in this, or I have questions about the work that you're doing. Um, so this can also be like a really good resource. And you know, you uh, it's really nice too in that you can actually go ahead and log in with your UMD credentials or you can actually connect your LinkedIn so that it populates your um, profile and that'll save you a little bit of the trouble if that's something that you already have. And then finally, we just wanted to do a little bit of a plug for uh, the UMD Career Center events calendar. This is an events calendar on our website that is regularly updated with not only like networking opportunities, but also um, events, workshops, discussions. Uh, so you'll see there that in June, like we have a couple of different things we have, you know, uh, things available for like doctoral students. We have careers in mental health advocacy, um, careers in public health. So there are a lot of different things that are going on and chances are that whether you are here with us like as we're presenting or maybe you're watching this recording a couple weeks from now, chances are that there's probably gonna be something on the calendar where you can learn a little bit more about the world of work. Right. Right. 
And so I got one question in the chat just before I move on. Um, a student asked, by any chance, uh, do you know when potential internships with professors must be made and submitted for the summer? Um, I'm not quite sure if I know the answer to that. Trisha, do you happen to have any I think that's gonna. I think that's gonna really just vary by professor and what their needs are. So um, obviously just reaching out sooner than later. Uh, and again, being very clear about what your intentions are with that professor. Mm -hmm. which actually might be related to, I think, the next one, which is, yeah, research. Yeah. Um, but I just wanted to ask Jose, if you don't mind, to share your quick networking success story um, with Christina as like a kind of like, oh, who knew kind of thing. Like a oh, yeah, networking. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So with networking, you know, I know that we talked a little bit about like how to find people, but I think it's also really helpful just like over the summer to use your existing network and really talk about where it is that you see yourself going, maybe what some of your needs are. Um, I'm currently someone who's in the process of actually looking for um, a job, you know, outside of uh, Maryland. And I brought it up to my team a couple weeks ago, just kind of like in passing, you know, a little joke, like, you know, this is something that uh, is my next step. Like if anyone knows anyone who's hiring, like pass it along, these are my interests. And one of my team members actually knew someone, uh, her roommate was a hiring manager for an organization in DC whose interests and missions like aligned perfectly with what I'm interested in. Um, so there was a hiring and I ended up submitting an application. I'm, I interviewed for it and I'm now in the process of like waiting to hear back from it. But you know, that was something that kind of happened by accident. So it makes me wonder a little bit about like with that intention, what other connections can be made? Like what else can happen? So all in all, I think the big lesson there is just talk to as many people as you can about what you're hoping to do. The more that you talk about it, the more likely it is that they'll remember it. So when that opportunity comes across like, you know, um, their email, uh, if they learn about something, you might be that person who they have in mind and they'll pass it along to. So I would just say like, be really verbal with it and be intentional with it too. There's nothing wrong with plugging what your professional interests are, what your professional goals are. Um, if anything, that'll be really helpful. And I mean, like I said, it kind of worked out for me by accident. So imagine what can happen if you do that with like intention. And then uh, just kind of connecting back to that question I'd asked about like potential internships with professors. Uh, potential inter internships with professors, for the most part, from my experience anyway, um, and Trish, I'm interested to see if this is also your perspective too. My idea of like internships with professors tend to be much more like research heavy. Um, and so with, you know, this slide, we're going to talk about conducting research with a professor. Uh, one resource that I absolutely want to plug, this is something that I use as an undergrad at UMD and something that I think can be helpful for a lot of people. I plug it in a lot of like my individual um, appointments is the Maryland Center for Undergraduate Research or MCUR. Uh, so if we go ahead and click through to it, this is a website that just you know, outlines a lot of different information related to the research process as an undergraduate. So you'll see there that there are a couple tabs at the top that talk about, um, like for example, like presenting and publishing research, if that's something that you're doing, maybe beginning to do research, uh, different research programs that are happening on campus. There's a lot to play around with on this website, but for the sake of time, um, one, research, one resource that I absolutely do want to go ahead and highlight is if we scroll all the way down to the um, bottom of the page, are perfect. So in that little box that says for students, you'll see a link that says search MCURS database of fall spring semester research opportunities. If you click on that, it pulls up a database um, where you find a bunch of team member, a graduate student, um, uh, maybe like a research team here on campus. If they are in need of help, maybe from undergraduates, they will go ahead and most likely post it on this website and you can find those opportunities. So Trish is hovering over the uh, keyword of fields right now. You can search by keywords. Maybe there's like a topic that you learned about in a class that you're really interested in and would like to do a little bit of research in. You can go ahead and search, but I found that if you just leave keyword blank and hit search, it'll actually pull up everything that's at MCUR right now. So yep, it'll take a little bit of scrolling. Maybe you'll have to set you'll have to set aside a little bit of time to look through everything. Um, but there you get a sense of like 
what kind of projects are going on, maybe how involved they are. So if you know, you're someone who doesn't have much time in your schedule, but you still wanna get involved with research, you can get a sense of how involved these projects are gonna be. And then, you know, in addition to searching by keywords, you can also search maybe by college and that can pull up like things that are happening within your specific college. And then we got a question about like, is there a limit to how many interns can be in a lab or internship due to COVID restrictions? Uh, I think that'll, you know, you know my, um, my initial thought is that that would vary based on the type of lab or internship. Uh, I would say that for a lot of, I think like labs and internships on campus, like they're trying their best to do work like virtually. Like I know a lot of labs, at least in the, um, in my home department, so psychology, like they're doing a lot of studies like online and a lot of that lab work is being done online. So chances are that they're like COVID restrictions maybe wouldn't apply. I don't quite know what that would look like in person though. That might be something that you would wanna ask like the um, uh, investigator or, you know, the uh, lead for that internship or lab. Any additional thoughts, Trisha? Nope, I think you're absolutely right that it's definitely going to vary by department and by how much can be done virtually versus what has to be, you know, in the lab, like what can be more desktop research or done on the computer versus like, no, we need to be in a physical lab with, you know, test subjects or what have you. Um, we also got a question about, do you know when research applications start for winter and summer? I'm guessing that means this coming winter and maybe even next summer, 2022. Um, again, it's gonna vary by department, but definitely at least checking, I'd say a few months in advance. Um, and sometimes even if, um, even if you reach out to professors now and they haven't posted anything yet, like just to keep, just to get them on your radar and them on your radar, um, so that they like when something does come up, they can let you know, like, okay, we posted something now. Yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna go ahead and come back to this question um, with the uh, with the last point that we talk about for this slide. So just gonna bookmark it really quickly. Um, but in addition to MCUR, there are a couple other things that you can do to con to you know conduct research, uh, kind of build those research muscles. And hopefully you can add that to your resume. Um, we've talked about this a lot, but just contacting professors directly. This, you know, if there's a professor that maybe you've taken a class with, uh, maybe you're doing well, you're really interested in what they're doing, you can go ahead and ask them, you know, like, what kind of research are you doing right now? Like, what does your research team look like? Are there any projects that are ongoing and that maybe you need a little bit of help with? And if you feel like it's maybe a good match and you have the time in your schedule, there's no harm in asking like, you know, is there an application process for your lab? Uh, could I possibly work with you? And even if maybe it doesn't work out with that professor, professors are very well connected on campus. Maybe they'll let you know about like research going on with other professors. Maybe they'll let you know about research that's going on with maybe grad students in their department. Um, and that's another thing too, like for a lot of your graduate TAs in your courses, chances are that they're maybe involved with research to some extent. So if there is a TA that you really like, maybe one that you have a good working relationship with, there's nothing wrong with asking them if they've got any research going on or if you know they're aware of research that's going on. And that kind of leads into this next point about like considering professors in related departments, schools. Um, research rarely ever happens like within like it's a bubble, like it's rarely ever limited to one department. Um, like I said, I'm in the psychology department, but a lot of our research tends to happen with people in uh, criminal justice, maybe um, public health, or maybe doing work with um, child development over in education. So because research tends to be interdisciplinary, um, chances are that even if you don't find something within your college, maybe professors, you know, TAs, people in your network are aware of things that are happening in other schools um, or other colleges here on campus, other people that you can reach out to. So I would just say like, you know, Keep an open mind and know that it might not happen specifically within where you are comfortable. Um, and again, this this uh, goes into the next, uh, the last point here, which is to so like maybe outside of UMD, such as through like departmental blogs. So with departmental blogs, uh, a lot of colleges and a lot of majors have them. 
where they'll go ahead and post opportunities for students. Uh, maybe there's an organization, maybe there's like a lab that needs help from students. They'll reach out to that department or that major and say, hey, can you post this? Um, can you post our information or like contact information? Uh, when I was an undergrad in psychology, I frequented the psychology blog a lot. And there I would learn about things happening outside of UND. So I would learn about research and clinical opportunities at Kennedy Krieger in Baltimore, for example. But departmental blogs can also be really good about um, posting just like lab openings, posting research opportunities, um, professors posting their own uh, needs within the blog. So with that point about like application deadlines for summer and um, maybe like the upcoming winter, like there's no, I guess like universal deadline, but if you do frequent your departmental blogs, um, if someone has posted like a research opportunity there, uh, chances are that they've also posted maybe like a, you know, a priority deadline or just like a definitive deadline. Um, so it'll change from time to time, but blogs can be a really good place of kind of like having that in writing and figuring out exactly what you need for the application and when you need it in by. All right, so we are getting to the end of the presentation. <clears throat> this is just a quick reminder that the Career Center is here for you every step of the way as you are continuing your, to figure out your summer plans and of course your plans beyond this summer. So just reminding you that we are open this summer. We'll be having more workshops and events like this one. We're also available for one-on-one -on -one appointments. So if you wanna meet with Jose or myself, you can filter by our names. If you've had enough of us, you can talk to another career advisor. Um, but we are available this summer for, um, the Career Center is open this summer for those one-on-one -on -one appointments. We're also doing resume reviews with our undergraduate peer career educators every day, our Monday through Thursday from four to five. Um, so that, that's just a like, same day thing you can do. Um, if you do end up getting an interview for something, you can do a mock interview with us. So just reminding you that beyond this workshop and beyond this summer, we are here for you every step of the way, whatever that may be. So here's just the seven things we went through to talk about how you might spend your summer. Again, you can do multiple of these things if you want to spend a couple hours a week volunteering while also working on your um, Etsy shop while also, um, you know, net networking with classmates, what have you. So. You can definitely do a combination of these things, um, but hopefully we've given you some ideas of how you can still maximize your summer um, even without an internship. I will put this back in the chat one last time. And then for anyone who came in late, um, what Trish is putting in the chat, this is your opportunity for getting the slides. Um, just go ahead and input your UID and then the passcode is 1234. Um, assuming you've, you've provided that information, you should be receiving this information afterwards. We went a little bit over, but we also started a little bit later. So again, want to be respectful of your time, but um, so I'm going to end the recording now, but Jose and I will be here to hang out if you have any additional questions. <laughs>